into a king's court empty-handed. And the most fitting gift is the gift of gold. You know, so it, gold talks about representing his royalty. And then it talks also about frankincense, not frankensteins. You know, frankincense, it represents his priesthood of worship. So frankincense is the type of, of, of resin come from a particular tree that are grounded together. And it was, con, uh, it was uh, transformed to become an ingredient into, that is very integral into the temple worship. So it becomes an oil, and it was mentioned 17 times in the Bible. Gold, by the way, it's mentioned 385 times in the Bible. Now, frankincense, it's always used when they are ordaining a priest. When they are to anoint someone, the oil was to be mixed with frankincense. And when they are burning it, you know, it gives a very sweet aroma that rises up. So when they were inaugurated ordaining priesthood, they always used this. So it talks about the ministry of Christ, Christ being the high priest. You know, frankincense is always integrated into the service, into the worship of the Judaism, Judaism, Judaism and, and the Jewish people. And last, myrrh, it representing the messianic role or death of Christ, his destiny. You know, it was mentioned also 17 times in the Bible. 14 are in the Old Testament. Three are in the New Testament. And what is interesting, that myrrh actually have such a lot of usage in the Bible. It, it is used for beauty treatment. It is used for perfume. It is used for analgesic or painkiller. It is used as antiseptic. But the most important, that is the most relevant to the story that we're reading, you know, is that the fifth usage, it is used as an embalming fluid. Fluid. It is used to treat the dead. So in the case of Jesus, it's kind of morbid, you know, a new baby, a new, a new child, and then you gave it, you know, instead of giving them one seed, you gave them, you know, embalming fluid. But this gift is significant because these three gifts will tell of the future life of this child. So it was represented and given to them to tell something that is prophetic. And what is interesting is that myrrh, from the Hebrew word, it is actually more, which is it's the same word that with the, the name Mount Moriah where Abraham sacrificed his son. So the old and ancient rabbis associated myrrh with sacrificial death, especially a sacrificial death that was depicted in the acts of Abraham when he were... He was about to uh, give his son Isaac in the Mount Moriah. Now, it is not coincident that Jesus was given myrrh. Jesus also was crucified in the same area, in the same mountain, Mount Moriah, where Abraham brought his son Isaac. So everything was connected. Everything was steeped with symbolism. Everything was steeped with meaning. And it all boils down together to paint a picture of who the recipient is to be. I want to bring this message to you so that you understand. Many times we read the word, but many times we don't understand the significance of it. We thought it was just, uh, you know, a funny coincidence. We thought it was just an interesting fact in the Bible. Anybody here ever get a, a gift that doesn't make sense? Anyone? You know, being, being uh, 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 26 years in the ministry, I've had my share of receiving gifts that sometimes uh, puzzle me. What, what, what is it, you know? But, so, but I can assure you that these gifts, they are, they are not there without meaning. But actually, these are gifts that are prophetic. These are gifts that are there to serve the narrative. And actually, these gifts have been prophesied long before. Actually, even in the book of the prophets, it says that the Gentiles will come and bring their wealth. The wealth of the nation will come to Jerusalem. So what is more interesting is that gold, frankincense, and myrrh has appeared in the Old Testament all over. But they appear together in one, uh, in one place only at the tabernacle. So only at the tabernacle. So uh, throughout the Old Testament, they were mentioned separately everywhere. But that one time they occur together is in the tabernacle or in the temple. I actually have a picture right here. So this is the, the, the picture of the temple of Solomon. So you see they are divided into three 
uh, uh, portion here, the first one, the second, you know, the, the, the inner court, and then the holy place and the holy of holies. That's where the old covenants were, uh, the, the, the temple, uh, the Ark of the Covenant. So this is where the inner court is. This is where they burn the meal offering, and this is burned with, mixed with frankincense. And right in the holy place, this is where they burn myrrh. And in the holy of holies, that's where they have the Ark of Covenant. Everything is overlaid in gold. So the one place that this three appears together is in the tabernacle and the temple. And what is the significance of it? What is the significance that these three are, uh, are, are depicted in the temple and being brought to Jesus? I believe there's a reason for that. With, 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 the, with this text as a backstory, we understand, we begin to understand that these three gifts were brought because Jesus will be building a new temple. Jesus' uh, Jesus's role is not just as to redeem us, but to rebuild the new temple, a temple that is not built with brick and stone and mortars, but a temple that is built in you and I. So we are to be the new temple. In John chapter 2, verse 19 to 22, Jesus himself says that, you know, the temple will be destroyed and I will rebuild it in three days. Uh, it was a reference of his body. And then he spoke in, in Paul in 1 Corinthians 6, 19, Talk about your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. God is restoring His new temple through us. And it is a work that was started by the coming of His Messiah, Jesus, to us. So this gifts actually is another reminder to us of what is to come. It is not just some three random things that they were probably in a hurry, you know. So, so you know, they were probably in a hurry and... and uh, okay, let's just, let's just grab whatever uh, we have. No, no, no. These are something that is meticulously ordained and ordered since the beginning. And it is to paint a big picture that is prophetic to tell about the story of Jesus. So that's the gift. And now how about the giver? Okay, uh, I, I can tell you that a lot of the celebration of Christmas has become uh, uh, um, uh, 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 incorrect because of the misinformation that is partly uh, because of the culture through the carols and the songs. <laughs> you know, because uh, if you pay attention, a lot of the songs that we love to sing, you know, uh, uh, in Christmas are actually not biblically accurate. Uh, you know, in this case, you know, one song in mind is the song, We Three Kings. Anybody ever heard of that song? We three kings of Orients are... That is a depicting of this story. But you know what? Actually, that just one sentence alone has a lot of problem that is inaccurate. You know? So the first thing, you know, we understand that there probably weren't three kings. You know? I mean, the, 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 Bible, the church tradition has ended up to name it just three kings and three camels because probably it's easier to put you know, in a drama and because they categorize it through the three gifts category. But actually, historically, it's not accurate because these people, they actually never travel just the three of them. They are counsel. They usually travel together as an entourage. And then secondly, they are not kings. The Bible never says they are kings. These people, they are actually, they are called the Magi or the Magoi. They are actually skilled philosophers, scientists, and wise leaders of, from the Middle Persia. They were actually advisors of the king. And they're not Orient. <laughs> so we three kings of Orients are. That sentence alone, that one line alone has a lot of biblical inerrance, uh, inaccuracies. You know? So the more accurate song, they are actually uh, uh, philosophers, scientists from, from Middle Persia. They are kingmakers. So if they are to be accurate, the song should be, we huge entourage of Medo Parsian from Iron are bearing gifts. But of course, that will not pass the songwriting committee. So we got stuck with we three king. So these people, they are actually the kingmakers. So the Babylonian have these people installed. The Babylonian believe that you can only become a king if you master the spiritual aspect. So... Back in that time, most of the, mostly, most definitely the, 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 the beliefs are not uh, Judaism, but they are Zoroastrianism. So they, they worship 
uh, a god named Ahura Mazda. But what is interesting about this religion is that this is monotheistic. But they are monotheistic in an area where most of them are polytheistic. So these are these people, and they were kingmaker because no one can become a king in Babylon unless they were picked. They were, uh, they, they were, they were identified by these people. So they were kingmakers. They were ones who identify and crown the kings. And what is interesting, if you look at your Bible, what is interesting is actually in the book of Daniel, Nebuchadnezzar was surrounded with this council, this wise man. And if we look closely, actually, in the, later on in the book, there's a Jewish person who ended up becoming the chief of this magi, the chief of this a wise man, and his name is Daniel. And in fact, there was a reason why these people follow the star and, and go all the way because historians believe that Daniel left his writing, his prophecies, and it was written, it was, it was there, it, it becomes their base of their readings so that when they saw the star, they understand this is the star that is going to lead us into the salvation of mankind. So this is something that is interesting. It looks like something random, but actually it's not random. It's beautifully designed by God down to the very detail. 600 years before the time, God has already knit everything together. You know. But many of the tradition that we come to know is actually not correct. You know. We know that in the Western tradition, they named this tree. Uh, uh, wise men, <laughs> Balthazar, Melchior, and Gaspar. Actually, the Bible has no recollection of their name. But this was more something, of, uh, uh, something that the, 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 they adapt from the Greek manuscript. But these people, they're not king. They're from Medo Persian, and they are kingmaker. They are somebody who is influential. They are smart. But they come to worship the coming king. So this is the giver. When you look at the box, you guess what's inside. You kind of understand that the giver, somebody says, generous, loaded. You know, this is the giver. The giver is someone who knows full well. It is not a spur of uh, an impulsive decision to give, but it is a gift that is well taught because they understood the text passed down by Daniel. And that is exactly the gift that they come to give to, con to become the continuation of the prophecy. How about the receiver of the gift? How about the recipient of the gift? Now we come to find out that the recipient of this strange gift, gold, frankincense, and myrrh, is Jesus. You know, uh, in 1903, in December 17, two young men, Orville, or 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 Orville and Wilbur, in Kitty Hawk, New North Carolina, they achieved something historic. They flew, Wil Wilbur and Orville, right? Okay. <laughs> Okay, they flew. So they're called the Wright brothers. So out of excitement, you know, they, they, they flew. They, they just go a little bit over like 130 feet. But that's historical for, for mankind. So they wired back to their sister Catherine in Ohio. Uh, and, and, and this is the, the, the message, the simple message read. We have flown 120 feet. Stop. And then they added a little addendum at the bottom. We will be home for Christmas. So, you know, the sister was so excited, she took the message and gave it to the newspaper editor who read those words, and the newspaper editor's response was, how wonderful, the boys will be home for Christmas. So he missed, overlooked the most important portion of the historical message. We have flown 120 feet, but what he read was, Nice, the boy will be home for Christmas. But you know what? The truth is that happens every Christmas time. You know, we, we overlook the grand news that a Savior is born. You know, we, we, it's overshadowed with gifts, with wrapping, with parties. Sometimes we, we overlook the details in the history. Like what is the significance of the gold? What is the significance of the frankincense, the myrrh? You know, what these gifts reveal to us about the recipients especially is important for us to understand. You know, because it is emblematic, symbolic. They were prophetic of the role that this child will serve. So who is Jesus? 
So this three gifts, when you receive the gift, when you see the gift, you kind of understand the recipient must be very important. The recipient must be somebody who is of high taste. The recipient must be of someone who, who is important. The same thing in this story. The recipient, Jesus. These three gifts identify who Jesus was. Why is gold? Because it is identifying his royalty, his deity, his divinity. It was a custom to bring gold as a gift to a king, as it was a custom to make everything from gold for an, ed, ab, uh, an image of deity. We know that in the, uh, gold is a symbol of divinity uh, mentioned throughout the Bible. Pagan idols were often made from gold. Uh, and also in the Jewish practice in the Old Covenant, the most holy place that we saw was all overlaid in gold. Overlaid in gold. Gold is the symbol that Jesus, by bringing gold, actually, this Magi actually acknowledged this son, this child, as a God and as the king. So this is not just ordinary child. Jesus is God and king. And then why is frankincense? Frankincense was a reference to his role as our high priest. So it's actually a, a reference to his ministry. First was his royalty and then his ministry. And then the third was his destiny for us. Frankincense is a, is a symbol of his, of his uh, ministry as a high priest to us. In the New Testament, especially in the book of Hebrews, 11 times Jesus was referred as our great high priest. You know, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14 says, Therefore, since we have a great high priest, who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith that we profess. And then myrrh was a reference of his messianic role. We know that myrrh is in, involved in the preparation of the dead. It is also a medicine. Uh, it was presented on the birth of Christ. It was also presented on the death of Christ. When Jesus hung on the cross, he was offered a drink, a wine mixed with myrrh. But Jesus wouldn't take it because he's going, he wants to absorb all the pain that pays for our sin. So his destiny was to die at the cross, to be sacrificed for our sin, for the payment of our sin. So by becoming our Savior, by dying on the cross. This is the recipient. The recipient is very special. And it was given a specific gift that gave way to the very identity of who the recipient is. He is God and King. He is our high priest, and he is our Messiah and Savior. Now, I want to close with the responses that we saw in this passage. You know, it's a short passage, 12 verse, but the, it, is, it is filled with interesting response. So the first response that we see is from a king named Herod. So I call this a foolish response. You know, I call this a foolish response, and because King Herod is someone who pretends like he's interested, but actually he has an ulterior motive. By the way, do you know that Herod was not a Jew? He's actually an Edomite, an Idumean. And his dad, Antipater, only rise to the kingship because he helped Julius Caesar. And Julius rewarded him by uh, being the king of the Galilean. And Herod succeeded him. And Herod actually, talking about a person who became a king, but highly insecure. But then he, was, he, he assumed the title Herod the Great, and he was dubbed the king of the Jews. So you imagine, here's the king of the Jew, and then there was kingmaker from Persia who came and said, where is this king of the Jew? I mean, can you imagine being Herod? You would say, oh, you're talking to him. But no, these three king, this, this kingmakers came and said, hey, we are here to meet the king of the Jews. So imagine the insecurity that he experienced, you know, and he didn't like competition. History read, wrote that Herod is not one that does well with competition. You know, he is a severely paranoia. History remembers him as cruel and paranoia. You know, he killed one of his wives, Mariamne, and then he killed his father-in-law, and he killed his two oldest son because he's afraid his oldest son will take his throne. How paranoia can it be? You know, in fact, there was a saying back in his time, it is better to become a pig than to be the son of Herod. 
So in fact, toward the end of his life, when he was ailing and he knew he's dying, at his command, he commanded all the nobilities, all the important peoples, all the leaders to be captured. And he specifically gave a command that on my death, they are to be slaughtered. Because they know that no one will shed tears during his sickness. But he wants to make sure that when he died, there will be weeping. You know, now you understand in Matthew chapter 2, verse 3, that when Herod the king heard this question, it says he was troubled. Troubled in today's version translation, he freaked out. And then it follows, and all Jerusalem with him. <laughs> when you have a king that is so paranoid like that, you don't want him to be troubled because then you will be troubled. So that's, that's him. And his response was pretending to be interested while actually he wants to eliminate the competition. Oh, by the way, should I remind you that he is responsible to the slaughter of all the young boy in Jerusalem? Because he didn't get the reply back from this wise man. He just wants to eliminate any competition as possible. So here's somebody who responded foolishly, evil man. And then I put here also the ignorant man, which is the scribes and the priests. Because if you look in the verse there, if you read through verse 1 to 5, when Herod God gathered his people, you would find that they say, oh, in Bethlehem and Judah. Without pausing, without thinking, they were not saying, a king, let us look through the scroll. A king, let us see the records. Let us see the, 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 the register. Uh, no, no, no. They did not even waste a breath. They say, oh, you know what? It's in Jerusalem. It's in Judah, in Bethlehem of Judah. They didn't have to pause. They didn't have to say it. They didn't say, wait a minute, let us Google it. No, but they said, oh, it's in Bethlehem of Judah. They knew extinct, instinctively the prophecies of the Old Testament and could at a snap of a finger answer the king. What does this tell you about this man? These are the theological religious elite who actually knows the text, but they're not looking forward for it. You know, do you know that from Jerusalem to Bethlehem, it's only five miles? It's only five miles. It's, it's, uh, it's the equivalent of here to Boston downtown crossing. Only five miles. I could walk for five miles. You know, and by contrast, this Magi, they travel some 800, 900 miles, months on their own expense, following the star to find the sun. But all this theological religious elite who knew the text, who knew what was to be expected, and they knew it was going to be five miles away from them, did not even bother to check it out. They knew where the Messiah were to be born. They could quote Micah chapter 5 verse 2. That's actually Micah chapter 5 verse 2 when they say it is in Bethlehem of Judah. It was amazing. They wouldn't get up to check it out. They are that ignorant. You know, they, they are that complacent. They don't want to rock the boat. They don't want change. They are already happy as it is. They're ignorant of the fact. You know, it reminds me of a scripture that says in Amos, Amos chapter 6, verse 1, Woe to you who are complacent in Zion and you who feel secure on Mount Samaria. Woe to you who are at ease. You're already comfortable. You don't want to trouble yourself to get up and look for the Savior. They know it. It's on their backyard, but they don't even want to bother to get up. This is the ignorant people. And then <laughs> we know the wise man, the Magi, who travel some 800, 900 miles on their own. You know, they humble themselves. They endured the dangerous and time-consuming journey. By the way, the route that they took is very treacherous, very dangerous. And this man, they travel with all their regalia. You know, I mean, thank God we're living on this day and age where it's more, you know, practical. But imagine this magi with, 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 the, with the camel, you know, with all their turban, with all their tunic, with all their robes, all their regalia, traveling 800, 900. Uh, what's the speed on camel these days? Anybody know? Like per day? 20 miles a day maybe. So, you know, I think it's safe to say a couple months. They endured it. And then when they arrive, here's what's interesting. They worship Jesus. They worship Jesus. 
as king and deity. How do you know, pastor? Because they have the right gift to present. By the measure of the gift, you can tell that they understand who Jesus is. He's not just a king, but he's a God. And then what's interesting, you, you, you read in the text, it says that they fall down and worship him. It didn't say they fall down and worship them. He didn't worship Joseph, Mary, and Jesus. He just specific worship him, which is Jesus. And then they opened their treasure and out came the gift and give it to him. All right? So this is very interesting. Before they give their presence, they give the first ultimate presence, which is their heart. It's not even, you know, the gold, Frankenstein, and Smurf. But it is their heart first. They fell down and they worship. That is the number one. I mean, these days we often talk about, you know, each of us, you know, if you love God, you must, I mean, you must give your responsibility to give your time, give your talent, give your money, give everything. But you know what? They, it all means nothing if you never give your heart. What is so important about this passage is that before out comes the treasure, first comes the heart. They give Christ the one gift that is fitting, which is their heart. He fell down, they fell down and worshiped him. They fell down and worshiped him. And when they worship him, they didn't just worship him as deity, but they worship him as king. This day, you know, we can probably worship him as our high priest, worship him as savior, Messiah. Sure, we all need saving. But to worship him as king is a whole different ball game. Because when you worship someone as king, it means that you are his subject. That he owns you. And you belong to him. And I, I read a story about a young naval recruit who asked for a weekend pass to his commander because he said to attend his friend's wedding. And you know, to his surprise, the commander said, okay, you can go, but make sure that you are back on the base by 7 p.m. on Sunday. What kind of wedding ends at 7 p.m. on Sunday? <laughs> you know. So he says, oh, but sir, the young recruit says, you don't understand. I'm in the wedding. I'm part of the wedding party. To which the commander says, son, you don't understand. You're in the Navy. We own you. We own your time. And sometimes we understand. We try to kind of give a little worship here, give a little worship there. We, but we, we are completely oblivious to the fact that who are we worshiping? Because when you worship a king, it means you are his subject. It means you are his. So many people can easily say, oh, Jesus, you are my friend. What a friend we have in Jesus. Oh, Jesus, oh, you are a sweet, sweet Jesus. <laughs> but to address him as king would cost you everything that you dear in your life. And that, my friend, is what the magi, the wise men, completely understand. I think they are wise because they understand that. Amen? So every gift reveals to you the gift itself, the content, the value, the significance of it. It tells you the giver and it gives sight of you is the recipient. The recipient of it. And today we learn of the response that was offered of such gift. Let me close with this first. John chapter 3, verse 16. Let's read this together, shall we? John 3, 16. 1, 2, 3. For this is how God loved the world. He gave His one and only Son, so that everyone who believes in Him will not perish, but have eternal life. Can you spot the giver? God is the giver. And do you know what his gifts are to us? He didn't give one of his like 20,000 sons. But what did he say? He gave his one and only son. This is a limited item. Number one of one. One and only son. Give it to you. And what can you tell about the recipient of this special gift? Anyone? 
It's a bit tricky. If you're saying everyone who believes, it's actually not right. It's actually everyone who is perishing. That's the recipient. Because the truth is, without this special gift, you and I are doomed to perish. But if we are to believe and accept him, then we need not to perish. You need to understand that you are that special. That he gave his one and only son. Amen? So that is why the saying is true. That today, wise men and women still seek him. And I hope that you and I will be part of that wise man and woman who is still seeking him, to worship him as God and King, to adore him as our high priest, and to honor him as our Messiah and as our Savior who died in our place. Amen? That's why the song that we sing is so fitting. We are gratitude of his goodness. Can I invite all the musicians to come again and let's sing that song? as we are preparing for the candlelight. So I throw up my hands and praise you again and again Cause all that I have is a hallelujah Hallelujah Nothing else fit for a king. Can we have the lyrics? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Would you all stand with me and join in singing this? Let's just worship him. Let's just honor him. Let's just tell him. Let's just thank him for the gift. Father, we thank you. For tonight we know who you are as a father. We know who you are as a generous father. You are a good father who knows how to give good gifts. Lord, we thank you, Lord. Tonight above all nights, we thank you, Father, for loving us so much. That you give us, oh God, the one who's perishing. We are all doomed to perish, oh God. But you gave your one and only son to us. We thank you, Lord, for the word becomes flesh and dwell amongst us. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. We are at loss of word, oh God just want to say thank you to you, oh God. Thank you, Lord, for loving us that much. For loving us, oh God, that much. For loving us that much, oh God. 
for setting aside all our sin, O oh Lord, all our transgression, all our trespasses, all our iniquity, O oh God, and running to us and embracing us, O oh God, and giving your only Son, your one and only Son. Lord, this evening, O oh God, I pray, O oh Lord, that this meaning will not be lost at just the hustle bustle of the celebration, O oh God. Something historic took place tonight, O oh God, of all night. I pray, Lord, that this becomes the beginning for the rest of our life, Lord, walking with you, worshiping you as God and King, embracing you and relying on you as our high priest and surrendering ourselves, O oh Lord, to you as our Savior, as our Messiah. Lord, we honor you, O oh God. I pray, Lord, this evening as we celebrate your birth, that every heart will turn to you, that every heart will surrender to you, that we will not just worship you as anything, but as King. May we come just like this wise man of God, and we come to bring our heart before our everything. That when we give our heart, and everything else becomes the overflowing of our heart to you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Give you thanks, Jesus. Amen.